Good morning, everyone. I'm Tamiko Brown Nagan, the Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study here at Harvard University. I'm delighted to see all of you uh, who are gathered here today for this uh, important conference. Uh, disability rights advocates, scholars, practitioners, students, and community members, welcome to Radcliffe. I want to begin by thanking uh, today's distinguished guests for participating in this event. Thanks as well to uh, Rebecca Wasserman, who's the Executive Director of Academic Ventures here at Radcliffe, to Jessica Vicklin, Director of Events, and to their outstanding teams. I'm especially grateful to our moderators, Sherry Blauet and Michael Stein, for co-directing the planning committee that conceptualized this conference. And I'll introduce them uh, and turn things over to them in just a minute. First, I want to start off with some words about uh, this really important topic that we're considering today. We will explore how ideas of belonging, community, and citizenship interact both with our understanding of disability and with important policy questions related to disability. We know from research and from abundant anecdotal evidence that people with disabilities often face multiple barriers to full societal inclusion and to freely and fully exercising their citizenship rights. These barriers include stigma and exclusionary social norms, inaccessible built environments, prejudice, overt discrimination, and more. People with disabilities also are frequently precluded from accessing equal education, healthcare, and other critical benefits. This is both a civil rights and a human rights issue. Here in the United States, we've made some progress in the realm of legal protection. It was 28 years ago that Congress passed the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 with strong bipartisan support in Congress, uh, both the Senate and the House. The ADA prohibited disability-based discrimination in all areas of public life, including at school and at work. But we have not fully conceptualized, much less realized, equality for individuals with disabilities. Anti-discrimination laws like the ADA are necessary and they're very important, but they're not sufficient to ensure dignity and equality. This is partly because we often fall short when it comes to implementation of the law. But more fundamentally, it's because anti-discrimination laws do exactly what you think they do and not more. They prohibit discrimination and they demand equal treatment before the law. But as Michael has so compellingly argued, equal treatment before the law can coincide with seriously unequal opportunity. This is especially true in the case of disability. To achieve true equality and full inclusion, we need a much broader set of policy measures and other levers of global and local change. Our speakers today will highlight the breadth and the complexity of these and other critical issues at the intersection of disability and citizenship. And they'll explore how we, as a society, can make meaningful progress at the international level, at the national level, and yes, here at Harvard. To kick things off, we're going to uh, introduce to you Sherry Blauet and Michael Stein. I'm delighted to have both of them here, and you can read more about them in our program. Sherry is an assistant professor of physical medicine and rehabilitation at Harvard Medical School, and she's a physician at Brigham and Women's and the Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital. Sherry also is a three-time Paralympic athlete in wheelchair racing with seven medals to her name. And she's a two-time winner of both the Boston and the New York City marathons. Yes. <laughs> Michael, my law school colleague, is the co-founder and executive director of the Harvard Law School Project on Disability and a visiting professor at Harvard Law School. He's one of the world's leading experts on disability law and policy 
and he helped to draft the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. He regularly consults with governments and non-governmental organizations across the world on disability laws and policies. Please join me in warmly welcoming Sherry Blauett and Michael Stein. Thank you, everyone, and good morning. And uh, thank you, Dean, for the very kind introduction um, and for this truly profound opportunity to be here with you today uh, for our discussion around disability and citizenship, excuse me, citizenship, uh, global and local perspectives. It's really incredible to look out upon this audience um, and so many colleagues and friends, both old and new, as well as knowing that so many are tuning in over the live stream from literally across the country and from many corners of the world gathered to join us for this really timely and really important discussion. Um, we'd like to take a moment to reflect upon how we got here and to particularly thank our hosts, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies, who've supported this journey and served a really critical role in bringing this together, catalyzing this event, convening and sponsoring the initiative. So approximately a year and a half ago, um, I had the opportunity to meet with uh, Becky Wasserman, who's the executive director for the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies, to learn more about various ways that we could engage with their work. And in that conversation, she shared with me that the theme for the coming year uh, would be based around citizenship. And of course, when I heard this, my interest was initially very piqued, and then my wheels started turning in my head. And after a few seconds, we said, well, do you think we could do something around disability and citizenship? Um, and as I recall, I think Becky paused and a smile sort of spread across her face and the idea was really born in that moment in immediately realizing that there's a conversation to be had, a very important and timely one um, that brings us all together here today. So our journey will explore a lot of themes around citizenship and disability with particular focus on things like cross-generational perspectives, thinking about intersectionality, higher education, um, thinking about um, cross-cultural perspectives of what this experience is like and how we think about disability and citizenship not only here in the US but around the world. We'll really think about how this can be translated into policy and systems change so that these conversations can be taken out of the walls of this room or even outside of the live stream and really thinking about how we can impact what's going on in our world in such a dynamic time. And we'll get to ask hard questions like, what can really be done to elevate our voice as a disability community and be taken seriously in this national and international discourse around diversity and inclusion? And in a world where currently topics around race, gender, sexual orientation, other um, minority-based issues are really at top of mind, how can we come together to have our voices heard in those conversations? Most importantly, when we think about the current political context, you know, what's happening around disability? Are people becoming more engaged or more disenfranchised? These are all difficult questions and meaningful conversations that we'll have the opportunity to explore today. And I think that all of us in this room know that for the one billion people around the world with a disability, the time to act is really now. And we really need to bring recognition to the fact that disability impacts every single one of us. Indeed, it's a ubiquitous life experience. These conversations don't just impact a small group of people, but really every citizen of our country and of our world. I was only 10 years old when the ADA was passed in 1990, as the dean just described. And at that time, I was living on our family farm, and I had no idea that a law had just passed that would impact my life so dramatically. Um, little did I know that you know, opportunities, like being able to compete as an athlete, to go to medical school and practice as a physician, here at Harvard um, would be some of the outcomes of that law and all the advocacy that came around in enacting it and bringing it to um, its, its um, impact across cultures. Um, so I really am a member of what we would call that ADA generation. Um, and we've had the privilege of being a, you know, a beneficiary of that groundwork in many ways, um, and particularly uh, a beneficiary of the work that's been ongoing for so many decades by people that will be speaking here today. Uh, like Judy and Andy and Tom and so many others um, of our distinguished guests. So we're so profoundly thankful for that, but we know there's uh, a future ahead that we need to think about critically. So before we begin, a few um, housekeeping notes. Um, if you're social media inclined, please don't hesitate to use the hashtag, which is, I believe, 
around. It's hashtag disability citizenship. Uh, and we'd love for the social media conversation to really take off and for people to notice what we're doing here today. Uh, so don't be shy. Um, there's restrooms on every floor, um, and there will be a break officially at 1115. Uh, but of course, please feel free to come and go if you need to prior to that. Uh, and there's also a, an address and a link that's printed on the front page of your program if you um, would like to access uh, CART services and if that would be helpful. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Professor Stein. Thank you, Dr. Blowett. And before introducing our keynote and discussant, I just want to echo Sherry in thanking Radcliffe and the Dean and Becky and Jessica and everyone else for convening this event. Uh, it's probably the fourth or fifth event that I've participated in with Radcliffe, and it's a demonstration of how Radcliffe situates itself within the university as a convening force to pull together all kinds of disciplines and perspectives to focus on particular issues and to be inclusive. And so kudos to that and to my colleague, I wish you a wonderful deanship. I will play with you as often as you can tolerate me. <laughs> Um, it is a wonderful day today uh, because not only do we have a terrific subject that's important and well listened to and that will be transmitted, but selfishly, Sherry and I get to see our friends. Mm -hmm. And we very much appreciate that as well. And we thank you for coming out and making time from your enormously busy schedules. Some of our speakers, as you will hear, literally are around the world and in between trips around the world, and they've made the time to be with us today. So thank you very much to our speakers. My privilege is I get to say nice things about Judy Uman and Tom Hare without them getting to object. <laughs> <laughs> so our discussant, and, and I will follow the dean in noting that we have the bios in your forms, and I'm not going to read them because that would be a waste of time. I'd rather tell you some of the things that are not in the bios. Our discussant, Tom Hare, professor at the Graduate School of Education, as you know, worked under the Clinton administration, helped to formulate the regulations for the Individuals Disabilities Education Act after its reauthorization, things that are now being challenged by current governmental objectives. Um, but what you don't have in your booklet is that, although he claims to be retiring, and somehow I'm gonna find in my heart to forgive you at some point, <laughs> Tom is the glue on disability around the university. Students with disabilities, those of us who teach in the area of disability, those of us who have disabilities and are on the professional side of it, Tom is the leading person. He's the one we all connect with, uh, and we enjoy our interaction, and we learn from him. Tom has used his knowledge as a Chicago deputy supervisor of schools, as a Boston school supervisor, as a person who has assessed inclusive education around the world, but also doing particular studies in, in Boston and New York to illuminate the role of inclusive education and how it's not only possible, but it makes sense. He has used his scholarly agenda to describe how students with disabilities got to Harvard, how do you achieve the mountain, and what things went into achieving the mountain, and what lessons we can learn from it. But for the students with disabilities who we have across the university, if they happen to be uh, unfortunate enough to have my class will tell me, you know, I've had Tom Hare's class. <laughs> you are, you've been a co-conspirator, a friend. I have enormously enjoyed so much when we do home and away visits in our classes and our regular conferences between HPOD, the Harvard Project on Disability, and Harvard Graduate School of Education, and we're not gonna let you retire. <laughs> we're, not, we're not possibly not letting you retire. Our keynote, Dr. Judith Human doesn't need a, an introduction, but she'll get one anyway. <laughs> one of the most well-respected, well-traveled, well-known disability rights advocates in the world, literally, without exaggeration. If you wanted to look at home and trace the arc of the American disability rights movement, you would begin with Berkeley and the independent living movement, the sit-ins in San Francisco to enact the 504 regulations to have them released, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act is reauthorized, and by the way, as Undersecretary uh, for Education, the implementer and the thinker around how to put in those regulations and how to get the Supreme Court's decision in Rowley, which said basically any old education is fine, to actually mean, no, we want to 
make sure that all kids have their full potential and move forward to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, where I was privileged to sit in the corner in the back with Judy and Charlotte and Sherry and others, uh, where I learned so much about her. What you don't have in this booklet is, this is the leader, den mother, icon, example, talkless talker uh, for generations of disability rights advocates and scholars. She has been the older sister to most of us in learning about disability rights advocacy and the person who has set the example for those of us who spend our lives reading, writing, and advocating on behalf of persons with disabilities. Judy is respected and adored around the world, and I echo and include Sherry and everyone else here to say you are appreciated and loved. So thank you so much for all that you do. Well, please ask the discussant and the keynote to come forward. Please welcome us. Good morning. We decided to make this, this into a conversation. Um, I thought it would be more interesting than my just coming up and lecturing, although here we are at, Howard, at Harvard, and how could I not want to lecture? And I said, I thought it'd be more interesting if we could get into a discussion. And so Tom is the person who's going to be leading the questions. And I think we're going to be speaking for about 30 minutes and then opening this up for discussion for about 15 minutes. So I really hope that you're thinking about comments you want to make, questions you want to ask, so we can kick this off, because the speakers for the rest of the morning are all dynamic and really exciting. You're going to learn a lot. And I would say this really, for me, is an opportunity to really dig deeper into what does it really mean for Harvard and universities around the United States and around the world to really begin to get in a more forthright way what it is that we're talking about. And I just want to add a little caveat. Uh, while the Americans with Disabilities Act came about in 1990, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act came about in 1973. And let me just say that every university in the United States, community college, college, has had the obligation to do what we're talking about today since 1973. And so I think we need to put that into perspective um, that this is not a 28-year-old uh, requirement. It's something that's much longer than that. So, yeah. <clears throat> um, as a young person, when I was in college, uh, one of the most memorable events I had, uh, I worked in a volunteer program for the Worcester, you've got to be from Worcester to say Worcester, um, <laughs> Massachusetts um, uh, ARC. And uh, I was working with a group of parents who had kids who had multiple disabilities. And they were petitioning the Worcester Public Schools for a class for their kids in 1970. And the Worcester Public Schools said no. Um, and for me, that brought up a whole issue of belonging, of I thought all kids went to school. Um, and for me, it was a great epiphany that actually not all kids went to school as recently as 1970. So this issue of belonging was, rang true to me as, at the time, being an emerging, emerging uh, gay identity person, um, closeted but trying really hard to get out. Um, and so Judy and I have discussed this for quite a, this whole fundamental question when you're talking about citizenship of who belongs. Your thoughts on that, Judy? So <clears throat> Tom relates to learning in the 1970s that not all children were in school, and I was a product of that. So I'm from Brooklyn. I lived in Berkeley for about 18 years, but I have to say that if I hadn't lived in Brooklyn, I wouldn't be the advocate I am today. And um, when I was born in 1947, my parents were immigrants, and my mother took me to school when I was five. But there were no laws in the 1950s, and um, the principal said I was a fire hazard, and so was not allowed to go to school. But told my mother not to worry, because they would send a teacher to our house, and they did for two and a half hours a week. Um, not for kindergarten, for the first, second, third, and half of the fourth grade. And then I was granted um, a screening uh, 
by the Board of Education in New York. I had to go to a school for a week, be observed, have an evaluation, come before a committee that made the decision as to whether or not you got to go to a segregated, second-rate educational program. But I passed and uh, got into this program. And one of the important things about that was it was the first time that I was ever meeting other disabled people. So while I had had my disability since I was 18 months old, and I had polio, so I was in the hospital and I met people there, but I hadn't really been with a group of peers, other disabled individuals. Um, I need to kind of also say that as a nine-year-old going into segregated classes in a regular school, there were also children 16, 17, and 18 years old in my class. So what I learned very early on was, at that time in New York City, again, no laws, um, the children in the special ed classes stayed there until they were 21 years old, and then were expected to go to sheltered workshops. It was my mother organizing with other mothers that got the Board of Education to make high schools accessible in New York City so that I did, in fact, not go back onto home instruction for high school, but was able to go to school. I think one of the important parts of the stories that Tom and I are saying right now is the fact that, you know, outside of families who had kids with disabilities who were working on getting children into school, there was not a lot of um, concern being expressed. Uh, the fact that disabled children were not going to school was really not a major issue. And for those children who were in school, there was not really a lot of work going on to determine whether or not we were getting the same education as children in the same school that I finally got to go to. And I think that really speaks to the low expectations. And the reason why I think the issue of low expectations is really important, and a lot of work that Tom and I did in the Clinton administration uh, really was and still is addressing the issue of low expectations. Um, because you're not able to really move to a higher level of discussion if the majority of people in the world really have not yet been convinced that we as disabled people have the same rights as others. And I think one of the other really pivotal issues about belonging is so many disabled people do not identify as having a disability. And they, they don't have identity first images of themselves. We don't see ourselves as a community in the US and around the world yet as really being a political and dynamic force. A lot of work is going on in that regard but I think it's fair to say that one out of four people in the United States have a disability, and one out of four of those disabled people do not really come forth with pride to talk about who we are as disabled individuals. Many people have invisible disabilities. The stigma around invisible disability is very significant. And I think regardless of what university I speak at, I hear the same stories over and over again about the difficulty of feeling a part of the universities. Yes, progress is being made. Statements that are being made by faculty and others that really um, push people against the wall and make it difficult for them to move forward. So I think the issue of belonging, the issue of being able to look more deeply at points like lack of education, which around the world is still a major issue, and in the US, although children are in school, there are still, as we know, large percentages of disabled children who are not getting the level of education they need, who are not getting the support they need, and are still highly stigmatized. One of the things that, one of my wonderful experiences teaching here at Harvard um, is when I started, when I came here as a faculty member, I was teaching courses on inclusive education. And uh, I, um, I thought I'd be teaching primarily to non-disabled teachers, which is, is the case still, um, about inclusive practice. But what, the wonderful thing that I began to see in my classes where there were so many students with disabilities who were in my classes. And when I was a student here in the 80s, they weren't here. Um, and so one of the things that I, that my students who have disabilities and some who don't have disabilities, uh, who are very much interested in addressing this intergenerational question that this institute's going to be talking about, um, 
of, of situating themselves in the world and how do they make change. Um, I use you as an example all the time because one of the things that, that you have done, Judy, and I'd like you to speak a little bit about this, is that you've worked on the outside. You took over a federal building. Remember Secretary Riley used to say that? My assistant secretary took over a federal building, and now she's the assistant secretary of education. Um, <laughs> um, you know, you, you've been on the outside, you've been on the inside. Uh, I've only been on the inside, really, you know that. Um, um, and uh, I would, I'd like your thoughts about that outside, inside, and, and what advice should give young, younger people with disabilities about how to situate themselves? So I worked 20 years in the nonprofit world, and um, in 1993, when I went to work for the Clinton administration, um, I had to go in with the real conscious effort, knowing that I was going into a world of mainly non-disabled people. And uh, that was really something that caused me a lot of thought about whether I really wanted to go work, not only in a large, I mean, education was a relatively small bureaucracy at that point. It was almost 5,000 staff around the country. It's unfortunately smaller today. Um, but what would that be like? Because I had worked in disability rights organizations for 20 years. And uh, it was a very important, empowering experience for me to be able to be a part of the development of the independent living movement um, and the disability rights movement first in New York with friends setting up a group called Disabled in Action, then going out to California and being involved in setting up the first Center for Independent Living in Berkeley, and then going on with friends to set up the World Institute on Disability. And I'd been a number of nonprofit boards and dealing with disability, non-disability. I also was on a board at that point called the Over 60s Clinic. So from an intergenerational perspective, I was involved in issues around aging and aging and disability when I was young myself. When I made the decision to go work in the department, um, I knew that one of the reasons I was going to take this position was because of my fervent belief that government needed to be responsible to the disability community. And in the case of the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services, to parents who had children with disabilities. And as some of you in the room know, there's been a lot of contention between the parent community and the disability community, some in the disability community feeling that the role of parents um, needs to be held in check. And one of my big beliefs has been that the role yeah. of parents is really critical. It needs to be age appropriate, et cetera. But parents are the ones who are going to be giving the first messages to their children. So if parents can be exposed to strong uh, disabled individuals who have been able to fight the battles and move forward, that's a good role model for parents. And so when I came into the department and was lucky to find Tom and recommend him to the secretary and the president to be hired and the Rehabilitation Services Administration and the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research, um, it was important for me to assemble a team of advocates who were expert and knowledgeable in their areas, but who were not afraid of bucking the system. Because, you know, it'd be very easy to come into government and really, you know, play the game and not really remember where we all came from and why we were coming into government. And I think we were very privileged at that time that the Clinton administration really hired strong advocates with disabilities who today's administration wouldn't even blink an eye at, let alone <laughs> consider for a position. And quite frankly, in the Bush administration didn't either. I think the Obama administration carried forward what the Clinton administration had been doing in many ways. But what I learned early on was that you, when we were dealing with the reauthorization, um, my close friends on the outside were people from the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. And they were doing great work in the area of education for disabled kids. And there was no way that I was going to be involved in working on the reauthorization without bringing in some of the strongest advocates, including people like Julia Landau, who's here in Massachusetts and a very strong advocate in the area of education for disabled kids. 
And we had meetings and we had discussions. And one day I got a call from the Assistant Secretary um, of, legis of uh, yeah, legis Civil Rights, she was Winston. Oh yeah, Judy, yeah. General Counsel. General Counsel, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Who said to me that one of her staff was concerned because I had told them to please call one of these lawyers as we were moving forward developing <laughs> our proposals. Because I thought, okay, we need to know what everybody thinks, not just the lobbyists. And I said, don't worry, things will be fine. Everybody will learn to work and play together. And at the end of the day, that's exactly what happened. So what do I tell young people? I tell, not necessarily young people, what do I tell people who are thinking about, <laughs> who are thinking about you know, moving into government? Um, I believe it's really important that when you move into government, you have a strong set of principles of what you believe in, that you're knowledgeable and that you will learn in your job, but that when you move into these jobs, if you have a disability, um, it is really important that you don't forget that. Just like we, as we advance diversity across the board for gender, sexual orientation, race, socioeconomic issues, we as disabled individuals who cut across all those groups need to remember that one of the reasons we are coming to the table is because we need to represent a group of people who in fact are currently insignificantly represented. So we really have a responsibility, um, in my view, to make sure that happens. And when you come to a university like Harvard, where you're exposed to so much, the issue of disability being integrated, not just the students and faculty who themselves have disabilities, but really into the curricula across the board. I mean, in my view, we should no longer be having discussions about requirements since 1973 on accessibility. We should be digging deep into how is disability supposed to be integrated into the curricula. And we are not there yet. And that's, for me, why this meeting is so important. It's, I want to expect that the bathrooms on every floor in a building are accessible, which they're not. That a podium is accessible. Um, basic things for me to feel like I belong is that we are really integrated. And these issues are ones that are not just being discussed in a separate silo on disability, that they are being discussed across the board when looking at diversity. And I think Tom and I did a really, we really worked hard on that. Uh, when we were at education, we went way beyond just the mammoth amount of work that we had to do on the reauthorization. But in the department itself, we worked really hard on getting disability integrated across efforts. So we worked hard with the Bilingual Education Office. Because the Bilingual Education Office, there are a lot of disabled kids, you know, and they were not getting served. We worked with the Vocational Education Office. We got those staff and others to begin to think about how did disability fit into their portfolio? And when they were monitoring what was going on, how were they looking at that? And how could we do collaborative monitoring uh, within the department when we were going out to states to address many of these issues. So my message is, disability is not yet a part of diversity as it should be. That is your obligation to make sure that universities in fact live up to their obligations. And then it is your obligation in my view when you leave here, whatever job you're getting, is that if you have a disability or if you believe that disability is a part of the diversity agenda, you need to not let that fall to the side. You need to identify friends and colleagues who you can go to and speak to like I've done to ask people, am I a Martian? Which I had a good friend who unfortunately passed away, but I would go and speak with her when weird things would happen and I'd say, Kitty, am I a Martian? <laughs> I'd kind of get back on the page that I wasn't and uh, move forward. Um, one of the things that I think, I mean, I'm totally biased in this assessment, but you've been the most effective assistant secretary we've had, period. And, and when I look at the outside inside question and the advice to younger people, one of the things that I think cre um, contributed to your success was uh, on the human level, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> no, and I can remember one anecdote that, that that crystallized it for me. We were having a meeting with the Republicans on the Hill, the Republicans were in charge, 
And all of a sudden, I, I see Judy wheel over to the corner. And your mother had just passed. And one of the staff's mothers had just passed. And the two of you were having a cry over in the corner, a conservative Republican. And I said, you know, Judy can get anything done. Um, because on the human level, you related to people. Uh, it wasn't just that this was the right thing to do. It was, you know, how can you possibly oppose me because of who, you know, because of the person you were? And I think that that gets, uh, I think people don't recognize the importance of that. I mean, I think I'm an extrovert, for those of you who don't know me. <laughs> On the Myers-Briggs, I'm like way off the chart. And so um, I, I love to talk to people. I love to learn from people and hear people's stories. And when, you know, I always get emotional too. I was at a meeting yesterday. There was a, a woman, uh, one of the, a student here who was getting emotional about something. And I said, I get emotional all the time, so don't worry about it. But I think stories are very important. I think regardless of the story you're telling, people need to hear stories. They need to understand, today we're discussing disability. And again, disability cuts across race, socioeconomic status, da 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 da. So we need to hear people's stories about good and bad things. People need to be able to express the pain that they're feeling when not feeling like they belong. When asking for things that should in fact not have to even be asked for, but are not being given, and having to figure out how do you move forward in asking those stories. Why were the hearings, well, I guess stepping back to the uh, Section 504, after that uh, provision of the Rehabilitation Act was passed, um, a gentleman named John Wodach, who some of you may know, who um, worked in the Department of Justice, first at Health, Education, and Welfare, when 504 came out, it was a small piece of legislation, 40-some words. And nobody knew what it was going to mean not to allow discrimination um, for an entity that was receiving money from the federal government. So they went around the country, and they held meetings, and they talked to disabled people. Justin Dart did the same thing when the ADA was moving forward. He went around the country to every state and had people tell their stories. Because in the area of discrimination, uh, not a lot of people believed that discrimination was pervasive in the United States. Maybe it happened here and maybe it happened there, but you know, nobody really meant it. Nobody really meant to say you were a fire hazard and you couldn't go to school. Nobody really meant that you weren't gonna go to high school. Nobody really meant that you weren't gonna get a job. Well, that was all bullshit. But, <laughs> I mean, let's be real. You know, maybe some of the issues around discrimination and race and disability are different because if you're God-fearing and no one is supposed to do anything bad to a disabled person, um, so it wasn't intentional or whatever. But the reality is we need to be able to assert ourselves in a way which allows us to give people permission to tell their stories and to listen, and to do more than just listen. So a lot of what every one of the speakers today will be talking about, or if you talk to them on the side, will tell you, is that people call and ask questions. People want to talk to you. They want to tell their story. And if it's something great that's happened, they want to tell it. But if they're having a problem, they want you to listen. They want you to help find a solution. They may have the solution, and in many cases they do. And in fact, what they need is your moral encouragement to enable them to go forward. It's the am I a Martian? No, you're not. Go fight for what you believe in. I'll be here for you to do that. We'll be here. Why, does it, why is it important that we have a strong disability rights movement that's not only in the United States, but that's an international movement? It's because our stories are so the same. The unfortunate truth is our stories are so the same. They may be different because in the United States we've had our laws longer than in some other countries, but the level of discrimination, segregation, feeling of being not a part of a community, not belonging, are across the board. It is important to say 
that that is progressing. This convening would not be happening today if it weren't for the fact that Michael and Sherry and Tom and other people here at Harvard and students and the Radcliffe Institute didn't recognize that this was important. But listen to people's stories, allow people to feel that they are a part of a movement, encourage people to feel that they're a part of a movement, that their voices are important. And I mentioned briefly earlier the issue of invisible disability. Because so many people have invisible disabilities, whether it's a learning disability or ADD or diabetes or epilepsy or cancer or a severe back problem or whatever the hundreds of labels might be, those individuals need to recognize that they are protected by the law and that, in fact, their voices are important. And getting people with invisible disabilities to disclose, to feel like it's safe to disclose and to discuss it and to come together as a group is very empowering. And it's something that I think produces success and I feel like I'm one of the people, like many in this room, who really encourage people to tell their stories, that we value their stories, and we value them being able to overcome adversity that they're dealing with through story and support. Very good. We didn't rehearse this one. Um, given the political climate that exists today, and the laws we have on the books, you know, ADA, IDEA, Section 504, um, Rehab Act, <clears throat> um, where do you think legal enforcement or lawsuits fits in, in this particular time? Um, I think we've always had to be concerned about litigation. Um, by that I mean, you know, one of the concerns when 504 was first moving in, into uh, implementation and the ADA is we wanted and still want to make sure that there is an educated group of lawyers and that disabled people and family members also learn about the law because it's important that we are thoughtful and not frivolous. And I think I, like everyone in this room, is deeply concerned about appointments to the Supreme Court and about appointments to the courts in general um, because of the conservative nature. And you know, I don't want to say that being conservative means you're anti-disability until proven otherwise. Um, but I am very concerned that um, we need to be more strategic than ever. And in order to be more strategic than ever, it really does mean that faculty and students um, need to really understand disability rights laws, need to understand what the laws do and don't say, need to understand case law, need to be able to look at how to build forward so that we don't lose things. And um, I think we're, we should also be at a point where there are stronger voices through academia that understand these issues and that are strongly working to ensure that when we are dealing with filing complaints, mediation, going to court, federal court, state courts, whatever, um, that we are able to have some meaningful discussions about what some of the challenges are so that we can be educating not just those at the universities, but at law conferences, et cetera. Because I think disabilities, as we've been saying, still much too absent. So the discourse is really important. And looking at disability as a civil rights issue, we need to be working across the board with other civil rights communities in a more in-depth, meaningful way. And I think people like Andy and Parada will be able to speak about some of that later today. But I think this is a very important issue. When do we want to open this up? Do we want to open this up now? Can we open this up now? I think there are two people apparently who have microphones. So, questions, comments? Judy, 
Uh, this question is for you. My name is Gagan Chabra. I am a person with low, uh, with severe visual impairment. You mentioned a couple of interesting points uh, about the fact that uh, low societal expectations and prejudicial attitudes are much more widespread, uh, and the experiences of people with disabilities worldwide uh, uh, converge. So. Often an antidote to that, you also mentioned that you have to have positive images and, uh, and, uh, and stories which are positive of people fighting and, and, and overcoming the disability. Uh, how do you kind of walk this tightrope uh, that the expectation levels don't, don't get blown out of proportion, for instance, you know, like the, uh, the media portrayal uh, often is of the super creep or a person who has a, uh, who is quote unquote this inspirational porn. So how do we kind of guard ourselves from uh, setting the right discourse, uh, if, if I may say so? And the reason why I ask this is because um, in the case of India, which has one of the largest population of persons with disabilities, just recently in 2015, uh, the government was talking about accessibility rights-based discourse on one hand, and on the other hand, it kind of uh, labeled persons with disabilities who were, who were severely stigmatized as divine-bodied individuals. And the reason why they said that they are divine-bodied individuals is uh, the idea is to give them positive, <clears throat> uh, positive connotation to disability, to say that they are that they are much better than regular humans. Mm -hmm. So how do we how do we don't not blow it out of proportion, and how do we humanize this whole uh, debate, if I may say so? I Thank do you. think we're much better than others. <laughs> <laughs> it's a well-kept secret. <laughs> um, Thank you very much for your question. And let me say that I feel it is very important that people dream big. And so um, I don't want to put a lid on someone's belief of what they could achieve because they have a disability. And I think, so I think your question for me really provokes a couple of different areas of thinking. Um, when I did start going to classes with disabled kids and then went to camps with disabled kids, um, and in the future you're going to see a film that's going to come out probably in 2019 or 2020 called Crip Camp, and uh, when it comes out, Harvard will be a great place to come and do a previewing. Um, the reason I raise this is because it was a segregated camp. Uh, the reason it existed was because those of us with disabilities couldn't go to the regular camps. But what was very valuable about the well-run disabled camps, and in this case, Camp Jeanette, was run by 1960s hippies who were progressive <laughs> drug-smoking guys and gals, <laughs> none of whom had disabilities, but um, were in fact you know, into a free love approach. So. Um, <laughs> But it allowed us an opportunity as disabled people to really begin to come together and think in a way that we hadn't been able to before. I, like many other people, have only one disabled person in the family. It was me. And my parents were really fighting for me to be able to become included in society. But, and they understood discrimination. I mean, they're Jewish. They experienced anti-Semitism. Their families were killed in the Holocaust. But disability is something a little bit different. And so the ability to come together with other disabled people and really just to begin to talk about how our lives were different than our brothers and our sisters and our cousins and our neighbors. How as we were getting older, we couldn't go across the street. We couldn't get on a bus. We didn't have you know, technology or braille or um, sign language interpreters or whatever it might be, we were not able to begin to really think about becoming a part of the quote unquote American dream. And so it was really important for us to do what many people considered um, beyond the realm of possibility. And so I want to encourage people to think broadly, not by themselves, although everyone has to have their own personal vision of, they, of what they want for their life, but also to be able to work with other people um, who have disabilities and others who've been a part of other movements, who've fought for equality and are continuing 
to fight for equality, how we can learn from each other. And at the same time, I think it's also very important that we address, I don't know, you know, the issue of super crip. I know we can have a very long discussion about that. Um, I think, you know, Superman, before Reeves acquired a disability, people loved Superman. When Supergirl or Superwoman or whatever she was called came forward, now Wonder Woman, we love that. So why can't a disabled person be a Wonder Woman? I mean, I think that's what we're not wanting to say that all people, disabled or not, are super anything, because we're not. But I want to make sure that people really can believe that, you know, we can excel, we can be super. The issue of religion, I think, is very important. I think we need to be doing a lot more with the religious communities. And I think we see in the United States there is some more work going on in that area and around the world, but I really think it's important. It's important because we want religious leaders to be looking at what the role of religion in their countries can be playing in the area of disability, that we are opening doors so that disabled people can become a part of whatever the religious community is offering. Not that we're a curse of or blessed by, but that we are part of and that as religious communities, we need to be putting our hands forth to help ensure that all people are able to make contributions. So I think obviously the issue of being from the divine is not where we want to be pursuing, but we need to be able to enter into a discourse with the leaders who are putting that forward to really allow people to understand this. Um, I was in Algeria once and uh, met I was at a wheelchair basketball game, and there was an imam in a wheelchair, and uh, someone introduced us, and we started talking. And the media wanted to know, why was I speaking to him? Well, I was talking to him because he was a religious leader in the community. He was also a basketball player, and he could play a very important role. So, you know, reaching out into our communities and learning more and getting them to be advocates, to see us as members of the community who can contribute, not who only need help, but who can make meaningful contributions, I think is a part of where we need to go. Question, comment. Hello. Good can you give me your name? Yeah. Hello, good afternoon. Um, my name is Claire Bergstresser, and I don't know if you remember me. We actually had a conversation at Northern Arizona University a few oh. years ago. Uh huh, okay, great. And you gave me some advice on how to go into the international community to advocate for disability issues, and I'm happy to say that these days I work in refugee resettlement, yes. advocating for disability. Um, so in that field, um, I'm seeing some resistance, some hesitancy and talking about disability for resettled refugees once they arrive to the United States. There's this closed atmosphere <coughs> where talking about disability, maybe in their world experiences, maybe as someone who has um, left a crisis, it has been safer not to talk about disability or has been put on the side as they've been um, escaping persecution. So these days, I'd like to have more conversation with families who are still struggling to talk about disability now that they're here in the United States. Do you have some thoughts on how I can have those opening conversations to folks who might be a little resistant to disclose disability or really um, invite it as a greater conversation? So let me ask you to answer that question. <laughs> and I'm happy to jump in, but how would you like to you know, pursue that? Well, I think for me, as someone who has a physical disability but only growing up in the United States, the, the trouble that I've faced so far is trying to connect to a different experience on, across the globe. But the thing that connects us is, the, as you said, the challenges that come with disability. But I think what I'd like to do is create an atmosphere where they can talk freely and safely, where universal design is an expectation upon coming to the United States. But the issue that I come across is because we talk about disability more than we have um, in terms of inclusivity, but it's still a long way to go, 
there are still challenges in creating spaces, um, even amongst people who work in nonprofit, to have those conversations. So I would like to have a space where folk, folks can talk about disability um, when they come as refugees, but I'm still facing the challenges where even in the United States, staff might put it off to the side or it might not be a priority because there are so many intersectional issues in things that are not exclusively about disability, such as refugee resettlement. So the reason I asked you to answer the question is because you experience this on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that's very important. And you are telling a story, and I think that's important. I really think it's important to share with the families that you're working with your experiences and to allow people to understand that there are opportunities in the United States, but there are also challenges. And I think it's important to try to see which other organizations in the communities, like Centers for Independent Living or other parent groups, or depending on the issues that are going on with the families, uh, that they're also brought in so that people, in fact, can expand their universe to be able to also meet other refugee families who have disabled people. Um, and some organizations around the United States are doing a better job than others on this. But I think what's very important is you've put a, a finger on a very critical issue. And that is that people who are coming from other countries also may not have very high expectations, may have no expectations about what can happen here. And so I think it really is important to help people learn about what opportunities are here and to also be a part of the discussion that's going on that disabled refugees coming here are falling through the cracks. They're not learning about the systems that are out there for them and identifying other disabled refugees who've been in the United States for longer periods of time. And I'm happy to talk with you about that. I'm sure there are other people in the room also, but to give you some names of people that you may want to speak to. But this is a very important issue, and it's not just in the refugee area. You know, you can pick many other subjects. So using your voice and your knowledge, I think, is important, and being a driver within your organization and within the refugee community providers of services, and also looking at opportunities where refugees may be coming together um, in religious organizations, in schools, social workers, really uh, trying to give people space and knowledge and knowing that you're there and that they can speak to you when they need to, if that's possible, I think is also very important. And remember, I think in my view, 100% of refugees have disabilities. They've been fleeing their country that gets psychosocial sure. disabilities. They may not, in fact, even know it, and so I think there are people like us who have more visible disabilities, um, but even those of us with more visible disabilities also have other issues going on. So I think it needs to be a part of the bigger discourse that's going on around refugee settlement. And I, I want to see you. I can't see you now, so I look forward to talking to you. Oh, there you go. I see your hand. OK. Congratulations on what you're doing. Over here. Hi. My name is Joanne Daniel Spangold. I just want to put a few things out there. Um, even though I've lived in one for 16 years, I'm not in favor of senior and disabled housing. I don't <laughs> like being segregated that way. Um, there are far too many people where I grew up in New Jersey who had survived the concentration camps. I don't like the idea of being marginalized that way. I agree I with you. I, I want to speak to, to you too. Go out into the community, seek out organizations that work with disabled people. Um, I work um, at GBLS, Greater Boston Legal Services. I volunteer uh, with the Children's Disability Project. And quite a few of the parents who are refugees don't want the stigma of disability attached to their child, even though the child needs services. And um, this is a big problem. But that's one of the ways that you can, that's two of the ways that you can get involved uh, and bring, bring people into what you're doing. Um, again, some people might recognize my last name, Daniel Feingold. 
That was the first name plaintiff in the T uh, access case that was settled in 2006. Things are better, but not perfect, and we're still working on things at the T. But I was involved from the time we were in discovery on, you can find places where you can fit, where you can really, really make a difference in the disability community. I fell into this. I was on the green line and was asked, have you ever had a problems riding on the T? After I finished laughing, the person who, get, who was to ask me that gave me his card, and from then I was, from then on, I was involved with the T and disability and getting things better. Um, it took quite a bit. Thank you. Another question, comment. Yep. We got a break. That's it. Sorry, I'm told no more. <laughs> to be the bearer of bad news, but I think that um, just for the, the sake of the schedule and to keep things on time, we're going to wrap up uh, this portion of the conversation. Um, I think I speak on behalf of everyone um, in expressing our thanks for to Judy and Tom. <laughs>